Take Radio, and today we're going over some antenna theory with Scott. He's going to be coming on and showing us how the radio wave is generated coming off the antenna. So play that awesome intro video! A quick shout out to all my Patreons who make this show possible. You can support me by joining Patreon in the link below. And on to Tank Radio! I am going to bring on Scott. Hey, Scott. How's it going? Calling Tank Radio. Calling Tank Radio. <laughs> I'm right here. Tank Radio. There we go. I got you. Nice. Nice. Um, what are we talking about today? Today, I, I asked you to come on stream to help explain more antenna theory. I want to get down to some of the nuts and bolts of the antenna theory. And I, to me, it's always kind of been a mystery how, you know, the, the RF wave comes off the antenna and um, becomes, you know, the radio wave that we all know and love and um, elusively well, hunt those DX on. It's really kind of a black art. And... Um... My point of reference has been this book right here by Chang. Now, that's not P.F. Chang, the restaurant. That's uh, this guy who wrote this essentially college-level text. Mm -hmm. It's got really complex mathematics in it that explains radio waves and antenna guides and uh, all kinds of crazy stuff. And uh, it's enough to really either generate extra cobwebs in your head or clean them out, depending on how well you can handle it. <laughs> but I put together some little animations here with the hopes of just trying to explain it at like a undergrad level, which was the way a, a professor explained it to us one day. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to try to repeat some of the stuff he did. Now, it's not high level PhD stuff, but it's enough, it should be enough. I just want to understand the concept. general theory and concepts and how, how does it work? And I thought this would be a great video for my channel and, and to show everyone. I have this antenna here. Um, he's just a basic dipole. You can see there's a little gap in there, which means the upper half and the lower half are each quarter wavelength. And he's just hanging out in space and a little uh, Star Trek Enterprise goes flying by. <laughs> now, we're going to hit this dipole on the top and the bottom with a balanced wave. Now, we all know what a balanced wave means, right? That's where you're positive on one side, negative on the other. It's not like a coax where you've got a shield and then a central central conductor. Mm -hmm. So if we start sending this uh, sine wave, and you'll see that the two sine waves are out of phase by each other, we start sending that into the wave, or uh, sorry, into the dipole, what we'll actually get is an electric charge. Now, I've paused it here because this one concept is going to be really difficult to visualize. You can see that the sine wave where it's crossing the dipole is pretty much at zero. It's not a positive or not a negative, mm -hmm. right? So that would be the signal that's entering the, the center split of the dipole. Since the dipole is one quarter of a wavelength, the electric charge that started out at the center gap took an, an amount of time to travel all the way out to the end. So by the time the, the charge makes it to the end, the wave that's hitting the center of the dipole is already going back to zero. That's because it's one quarter of a wavelength. Got that so far? Okay. Maybe you want to rewind that and play it again because it's kind of a difficult concept. Yeah, let's... let's, but, let's jump back what? a little bit let's jump back a little bit and see that happen one more time as the charge from the peak has moved all the way out to the end of the antenna mm -hmm. and then here on bottom the charge that started out as the peak on the negative side has moved down to the end of the antenna here in the middle of the antenna we're at zero volts on the top and on the bottom and we're at a full potential of voltage out here at the ends okay and consequently we've got this electric field now that runs all the way down from the top to the bottom. Mm -hmm. Now, an electric field will radiate from a charge in a direction that's perpendicular. Is that the, the magnetic surface. field? Or... No, that's an electric field. Okay. I'm not drawing a magnetic fields in this. We'll get to them later. Okay. The electric field now starts out at the top and terminates on the bottom, and it tries to leave the uh, conductor in a perpendicular uh, line but because there's an opposite charge on the other end, it gets to curve all the way back. Mm -hmm. And as I said, 
the charges here have reached full strength on the end at the time that they're in the middle reaching zero. Now, what's generally going to happen at, at this point is when the electric wave moves further and now it becomes negative on top and positive on the bottom, it's actually kind of like going to suck the charges back in. Or actually what's going to happen is the charges that have hit the end have nowhere to go. So they kind of like bounce back. So if we start to move forward again, and what happens is the electric field breaks off and goes out into space while the uh, leftover, the remaining part of the electric field starts to collapse back down. When it gets back down and flips over, now we've got the opposite electric field starting to build up. Mm -hmm. And let's stop it right there. And again, we have the same thing now. Negative charge went to the top. The positive charge went to the bottom. Right here in the middle of the dipole, incoming wave is, is going to be zero volts. So now we have an electric field that's of opposite polarity that's radiated out. So as we play that through, it just keeps radiating out these electric fields and they go out into space. So is that, that's how an antenna generates the yeah. Um, radio wave. Yeah, that's how the radio wave is uh, radiated out into space. So it's the electric fields that is leaving because the magnetic well, fields it's creating don't leave. They, they just create and combine and collapse. And I think that's what I wasn't clicking well, in my head. Well, the electric field does induce a magnetic field around it. I didn't draw the magnetic field around this because it really would have made the image a lot more complicated. N yeah. But an electric field... Um, in motion does generate a magnetic field as well. We'll get to that toward the end because it's the magnetic field that actually crosses the conductor and starts to generate a, uh, an electric current in the receiving antenna. That's essentially what we've got so far in, in the radiating of the field. Um, I have this other little animation which I put together mm -hmm. just to give you an idea of what it's like when you're dealing with distances. There's our little dipole again. He's hanging out in space. Let's just call him hanging out in free space. We don't really know where he is. But just to put a reference on here, let's like put a little ground, uh, a little surface there. And we'll put a little house off here to the side. Give you an idea of your what your radio shack is. Uh -huh. Now, this antenna, as we determined, is going to radiate out in essentially, let's just say, a spherical pattern. So now we have this sphere. Now, let's, let's do some math. Mm -hmm. The math is going to be really, really simple. Let's say this is a two meter band. Okay. So a half wave dipole will be one meter, right? Yes. Okay. And then the mathematical formula for the surface area of a sphere is four pi r squared. Right? Yes, that sounds familiar. So, so the radius is a quarter of a, is a half a wave, which is half of a dipole. If we take the radius and square it, it becomes one quarter. So four times a quarter becomes one. The only thing left is the pi square or the, the pi. Yes. So the area of this sphere is simply pi square meters. Um, if this antenna is radiating out 100 watts, you're going to have 100 watts evenly distributed across the sphere. Now, it's not going to be even. We'll get to that in a minute. But now, if we were to back out quite a distance um, to, say, about a football field or 100 meters, like 100 yards. There we go. There, yeah. Okay, so we zoom out. This uh, I used a little animation tool called Blender, and it actually is um, geometrically correct. So this is going to zoom out here and expand the sphere to something that is about 100 meters in radius. Mm -hmm. And that's going to work out to something ridiculous like 120,000, yeah, 125,600 square meters of surface area. Now, remember, we started out with pi square meters of surface area, which is about three. So now we have this much bigger surface area. But if we have an antenna, that's 100 meters away from this guy, and he's radiating out in an even pattern. Well, it's not really an even pattern because 
we know that a dipole doesn't actually radiate out in a sphere. It actually radiate, it radiates out in a donut. It's not even the good kind of donut that has jelly in it. It's, it's <laughs> a cheesy donut that just has the hole in the middle. I, I'm a sucker for jelly donuts. Yes. Raspberry is my favorite. We have the sphere. It's 120,000 times as big as the original sphere of the dipole. Any surface area on the sphere is going to be absorbing only a fraction of the original 100 watts that was radiated. Mm -hmm. This right here is a square that is one square meter. To our perspective? Formula, if we go into this book, the mathematical formula involves something like pi over 30 times length squared. So the interesting part about length squared is it's a square. Mm -hmm. So if we want to estimate the amount of energy that an antenna is going to receive based on its surface area, we can just use L squared. So I drew a little square here to give you an idea of what one square meter would be. And then this isn't actually on the sphere. I actually have a little animation here. There goes on the sphere. I was going to ask that. What what perspective was that one meter square? But now it's that in the perspective right in of the antenna. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That was right in your face. This is the one square meter on the surface area mm -hmm. of the entire radiation pattern, leaving that antenna at 100 meters away. So you can see it's really a small percentage. Mm -hmm. Now, imagine if this was even smaller. Imagine like you're using a 70 centimeter band or you know, even something in the microwave for the gigahertz band, this square isn't even gonna be one square meter anymore. It's gonna be even smaller. And the amount of energy that you're soaking up from the surface of the entire sphere around here is even less. That's why you need much stronger, more powerful, cleaner amplifiers in order to be able to pick up higher frequencies. Mm -hmm. As I said, this sphere isn't really the radiation. The radiation is really more like a donut, but I didn't want to get into the or a cylindrical math. donut radiating out. Yeah. yeah, I didn't want to get into that elliptical math because that would be even worse. But yeah, let's keep it simple. It's a nice yeah, sphere. That's what I wanted to do. <laughs> so anyway, as I said, if your if your uh, wavelength that you're trying to collect is even smaller, you have a smaller antenna. You're going to have a smaller effective sur surface area on that sphere. So this is, like I said, only 100 meters away. Imagine if you're a mile away or two miles away or 10 miles away. Uh, that's where your Yaggies come into effect because they actually, they don't radiate out in a sphere or even a donut. They actually project in one direction. A, a strong focus lobe. Yeah, they'll focus it in one direction. Uh, and... They well, they don't collimate it like a laser, but at least they they generally try to stay focused. And well, the other thing I was going to say about the uh, you can look up a radiation pattern of a dipole. The uh, gain you get at the uh, horizontal along the waistline of it is a gain of about one point four dB compared to what would be one d what, what would be a, a reference of one on the surface of the sphere if it was a true sphere. So the magic that I was having trouble understanding and grasping, it's, it's not the magnetic field producing the radio wave. It is the electric field. Because the electric field uh, is what radiates out. But as it's radiating out, as it's traveling, it's capable of carrying the magnetic field with it. Because the magnetic field is what's actually going to start to uh, induce a voltage or a charge, a current on the receiving antenna. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I, I, is, things are starting to click now. Finally. Start, I, I just wanted to understand what, what generates that the, the radio wave coming off of our antennas. And it was just, but that's part one of the antenna theory series I'm doing. Part two is going to be coming up next video release. And we're going to be talking about the inverse. How does radio waves part their magic onto an antenna and and give us the signal or give us he, he's just going to explain it come by on part two but thank you for joining until next time y'all go forth and conquer thank you to all my patreon supporters you can support me on patreon there's a link in the description below 
And to all my tankers out there, go forth and conquer.